If you're starting nursing school soon, this is the perfect time to sign up for Crucial Concepts Boot Camp. This nursing school prep course teaches success strategies, foundation concepts, and dosage calculations so you can start your program feeling confident and ready for what's to come. Sign up now and get a free study guide covering a topic so many students struggle with, all electrolytes. Go to straightanursingstudent.com forward slash boot camp to sign up for Crucial Concepts Boot Camp and get a free electrolytes study guide. That's straightanursingstudent.com forward slash boot camp. Well, hello, I'm Nurse Mo, and this is the Straight A Nursing Podcast, where I teach nursing concepts and share tips on how to thrive in nursing school and beyond that at the bedside. I'm really excited, as usual, today about this episode. Before we hop into that, let's take a quick minute for a listener shout out. And this one goes out to Carrie, who says this. I decided to purchase the boot camp after struggling with med surge. I wouldn't have passed without it. The modules are very detailed, easy to follow, and lined up with my textbook. Worth the money. Five stars. Carrie, thank you so, so much for taking time to share your experience with Crucial Concepts Boot Camp. And I want to let anybody know who's listening, who's interested in also thriving in nursing school like Carrie, that I will include the link to Crucial Concepts Bootcamp in the episode notes, but I also have a dedicated course for Med Surge, and that is called Med Surge Solution. So I'll link to that as well. I love when the programs that I spend so much time and love creating actually help students succeed. That's exactly why I made them. So Carrie, thank you so much for that. All right, we're going to be talking about graft versus host disease today. So let's start out with three stat facts about graft versus host disease. Stat fact number one, the volume losses with diarrhea and graft versus host disease can be up to several liters per day. Stat fact number two, when a male patient receives a graft from a donor who has been pregnant in the past, the incidence of graft versus host disease increases. And stat fact number three is that acute graft versus host disease occurs in between 30 and 70 percent of transplant recipients. So now let's dive into graft versus host disease. And if you're a little bit fuzzy on the concept of stem cell transplant or bone marrow transplant, take a moment, pause this episode, go back and listen to episode 279, which will set you up to really understand all the concepts that I talk about in this episode. So you're still with me? Okay, great. So graft versus host disease, or GVHD, as you'll often see it abbreviated, is a complication that can occur after allogeneic hematopoietic cell transplant. So it's a syndrome that involves multiple organs and occurs when transplanted immune cells identify the recipient cells as foreign invaders. So the result is that the transplanted or graft cells attack the recipient or host cells. The primary targets of graft versus host disease are the skin, mouth, GI tract, the eyes, and the liver, but can affect any tissue or organ in the body. So there are two main subtypes of graft versus host disease. One is acute and one is chronic. So in acute graft versus host disease, the condition has a sudden and rapid onset within the first 100 days after transplantation. And then in the chronic form, the condition is long-term and can involve organs throughout the entire body. Now, you might be wondering who's most at risk for developing acute graft versus host disease, and that's going to be individuals with an HLA mismatch, and we'll talk more about this in just a moment. Individuals who receive stem cells from a donor who is not related to the host, individuals who were undergoing radiation as part of the transplant regimen, an older donor or recipient, and female donor combined with a male recipient. Risk factors for chronic graft versus host disease include those mentioned above, plus having a prior incidence of acute 
graft-versus-host disease, or receiving stem cells from peripheral blood versus stem cells from bone marrow or cord blood. So a moment ago, I mentioned HLA mismatch. So let's talk about HLA typing. So prior to allogeneic transplantation, both the patient and the donor must go through extensive testing to ensure that the donor's cells are a good match. One specific test, the HLA or tissue typing test, looks at HLA proteins that exist on the surface of cells. These proteins essentially tell white blood cells which cells are self and which cells belong to a pathogen or an invader. If the HLA proteins from the donor are vastly different from that of the recipient, the immune system gets confused and begins attacking the recipient's cells because they don't recognize them as self. So now you've got some background understanding about graft-versus-host disease. Let's dive into the nursing implications using the straight-A nursing latte method. If you want to follow along and take notes, I will put a link in the episode notes so that you can download the latte method template and you can just jot these things down as you go. It's a fabulous way to categorize and organize how you learn and study different disease conditions. And that first letter in the latte method is an L and that stands for look. So how does the patient look? Basically, What are their signs and symptoms? So the signs and symptoms of GVHD can vary a lot from person to person and whether the individual is experiencing acute or chronic disease. So looking at acute GVHD, we have a lot of symptoms associated with the GI tract. Patients with acute graft-versus-host disease can have severe diarrhea, which I mentioned earlier can be up to several liters per day. They'll have nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, abdominal discomfort, and may have blood in their stool. And then the skin can also have some signs and symptoms. The most common dermatologic manifestation is a rash that starts out as a faint redness that may spread to involve the entire body. Mild rashes tend to resemble a sunburn, while severe rashes can blister and cause the skin to peel. And then the liver may be affected. In many cases, liver involvement may have no outward symptoms and only be identified on blood tests. Some individuals will show outward signs of liver impairment, including jaundice, abdominal pain around where the liver is located, dark urine, bleeding, ascites, and even hepatic encephalopathy if ammonia levels get elevated. So acute graft-versus-host disease is classified by how many organs are involved, and how significantly they are affected. For example, the skin is classified by how much of the body surface area is affected, and the GI tract is classified by how much diarrhea the patient has each day. Patients with higher scores tend to have poorer outcomes and increased mortality. Now let's look a bit at chronic graft versus host disease. So individuals with chronic GVHD, which affects 40 to 50% of individuals receiving allogeneic stem cell transplant, can experience mild to life-threatening complications involving one or more organs. So some manifestations include, again, the skin. So skin signs and symptoms are varied and include a rash, non-healing ulcers, skin thickening, which makes it difficult to move the joints adequately, dry or tight skin, itching, changes in skin color, and intolerance to temperature changes due to damaged sweat glands. And then looking at the GI tract, common symptoms associated here are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, decreased appetite, and unintentional weight loss. With the liver, individuals with chronic graft-versus-host disease can have long-term liver impairment and exhibit all those classic signs and symptoms, including jaundice and ascites. And then looking at the respiratory system, the individual may have difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, wheezing, or a persistent cough. The eyes can also be affected. They could be painfully dry and itchy. Individuals may also experience blurred vision light intolerance, and may even have loss of vision and could even have blindness. 
Now, the joints and muscles can also be affected. They may be stiff. They may be difficult to move to their full range of motion. They may also experience muscle cramps or muscle weakness. In the mouth, they could have dry mouth, which is a very common symptom of chronic graft versus host disease. Other symptoms include painful mouth sores, gum disease, dental cavities, and difficulty swallowing. Individuals may also have sensitivity to hot, acidic, or spicy foods or beverages, carbonated beverages, and mint. In the genitals, individuals may experience irritation, dryness, painful intercourse, and a rash. And then the hair and nails. Loss or graying of hair is common, as is hardening of the nails. The nails may also become very brittle and may even fall off. So those are some examples of some common symptoms of chronic graft versus host disease. Let's take a really quick break, and then we'll come back and talk about assessment. Between the extra shifts I've picked up, the cookies I'm baking for those extra shifts, and all the shopping and wrapping and socializing, I've definitely been happy to have some factor meals ready to eat in my fridge. Just the other night, I was busy baking and wrapping until about 8 p.m. and realized I hadn't had dinner yet, and my husband was at the fire station, so I was essentially on my own. Instead of just reaching for a boring bowl of cereal, I had delicious caramelized onion and goat cheese risotto with a side of roasted carrots, and it was ready to eat in just two minutes. Seriously, I felt like I was at a fancy restaurant and not just maybe sitting on my couch with my cat in my pajamas at 8 p.m. Plus, I've been really loving these protein shakes on those days when I am rushing to get out the door. There's this one that's a cold brew latte, and it is absolutely delicious. It has something like 18 grams of protein and, bonus, a little boost of caffeine. It's pretty much perfect. So if your schedule's also jam-packed and planning and cooking your meals is not at the top of your holiday wish list, then check out Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. Head to factormeals.com slash nursemo50 and use code nursemo50 to get 50% off. That's code nursemo50 at factormeals.com slash nursemo50 to get 50% off. So the next letter in the latte method is an A, and that stands for assessment. How do we assess an individual with graft versus host disease? So assessments for this condition will be tailored to that individual's specific manifestations. Some general assessments include performing a full skin assessment. You want to make note of any non-healing wounds and areas where the skin has peeled, as these may require specific wound interventions. If the patient has diarrhea, monitor the amount and look for presence of blood in the stool. It could indicate that the patient may become anemic. And with a large volume of diarrhea, we're looking at possible fluid volume deficit. So you also want to assess them for volume depletion. Now, again, this can occur due to large volume fluid losses with diarrhea and can also be due to decreased oral intake, secondary to having some oral complications. So some signs of volume depletion could be tachycardia, hypotension, poor skin turgor, and dry mucous membranes. You want to take your patient's temperature as they are at higher risk for infection and assess the patient for liver involvement by observing for things like jaundice, hypoglycemia, and bleeding. If ascites is present, measure abdominal girth and assess for shortness of breath. It's also important to assess the oral cavity as mouth sores may be present that make eating really difficult or painful. And with that, ask the patient about their appetite and ask them about their food preferences. When we give patients the foods they like the most, they tend to eat more, which is what we want in a patient with graft versus host disease. They're at risk for unintentional weight loss. And another is to assess range of motion, noting that limited range of motion can affect ability to perform ADLs and can also affect gait, which puts the individual at high risk for falls. Now, the next letter in the latte method is a T for tests, what tests are conducted for a patient with graft versus host disease. So when we look at the diagnosis of GVHD, it's typically arrived at through 
physical examination by the MD and may also involve a biopsy of the skin or affected organs. And then ongoing evaluation is really going to depend on the patient's specific manifestations. For example, a patient with liver involvement will have their liver enzymes monitored, as well as bilirubin and ammonia levels. Cultures will be sent in cases of suspected infection, such as from a non-healing wound. In cases of severe diarrhea, the stool may be cultured or tested for C. diff and cytomegalovirus. In addition, upper endoscopy and or colonoscopy may be utilized and biopsies taken for further evaluation of the GI tract. So again, it's really going to depend on what complications and signs and symptoms the patient is experiencing. The next T in the latte method is for treatments. So what treatments are provided for graft versus host disease? So the treatments are really aimed at suppressing the donor T cells, which are the cells primarily responsible for that attack on the body's tissues. However, there is a complicating factor is that the same T cells are also the cells that mediate the immune response against the tumor if a tumor is present. What this means is that treatment must be carefully balanced to reduce graft versus host disease without decreasing the immune reaction against the tumor. A key treatment of acute graft versus host disease is prophylaxis. Preferred methods vary based on a variety of factors, including the graft source, the conditioning regimen utilized. And again, if you're wondering what I'm talking about, go back and listen to episode 279 and the degree of matching between donor and recipient. A common combination of prophylactic medications is a calcineurin inhibitor, such as tacrolimus or cyclosporine, and an anti-metabolite, such as methotrexate. Other medications may be utilized depending on the patient's specific transplant details. Another method of GVHD prophylaxis is T-cell depletion, which aims to eliminate the donor's T-cells. This can be achieved by giving the recipient certain medications, such as antithymocyte globulin, or ATG, either right before or right after transplant. Another method utilizes external removal of the T-cells before the stem cells are transplanted in the recipient. Should acute graft versus host disease develop, treatments include optimizing that prophylactic regimen as well as some of the following. So topical corticosteroids are often utilized for low-grade or grade 1 acute graft versus host disease involving a rash. Other skin treatments may include antihistamines and moisturizers to relieve itching. Topical tacrolimus may be utilized if a topical corticosteroid is ineffective. Systemic glucocorticoids like methylprednisolone are often utilized for grade 2 and higher acute graft versus host disease. Remember, glucocorticoids cause immune suppression and dampen down that immune response. Beclomethazone or budesonide, which are oral, non-absorbable steroids may be used for GI tract involvement. Now, some cases are glucocorticoid resistant. So when we have glucocorticoid resistant graft versus host disease, ruxolitinib may be utilized. Ruxolitinib, also known as Jacify, which is much easier to say, is an anti-neoplastic medication that can cause anemia, thrombocytopenia, infection, and other serious adverse effects. Supportive care for GI tract involvement includes optimizing nutrition. In some cases, parenteral nutrition may be utilized for those patients who have really high volume diarrhea in excess of about 500 mils per day. And in some cases, octreotide may be utilized on a short-term basis to treat diarrhea. Because the volume losses with diarrhea can be significant, it's vital to replenish fluids and electrolytes as needed. In addition, ensure the patient's skin remains clean and dry, especially if areas of blistering or peeling are nearby. Other medications used to treat acute graft versus host disease include other immunosuppressants such as mycophenolate mofetil and biologics that can slow or even halt inflammation. 
such as abatacept, which goes by the brand name Orencia, and alemtuzumab, which goes by the brand name Campath. Now let's talk about chronic graft-versus-host disease. These treatments will vary depending on the affected tissue and the severity. Mild skin symptoms, for example, may be managed with a topical corticosteroid. Moderate chronic graft-versus-host disease may be treated with prednisone, which is a systemic medication taken by mouth. Individuals with severe chronic graft-versus-host disease will require more extensive treatment that typically involves prednisone plus rexolitinib, which again goes by the brand name Jacify. Another option that may be utilized for chronic graft-versus-host disease is extracorporeal photophoresis, or ECP. In this procedure, blood is removed and the white blood cells are separated from the other components, and a drug that has been exposed to UV light, called a photoactive drug, is combined with the white blood cells, and this combination is returned to the patient. Now, specific symptoms and complications will be managed and vary depending on the patient's specific disease course. This can include things like skin ointments and creams, medicated eye drops and artificial tears, oral rinses, bronchodilators, supplemental oxygen, physical therapy, and even antibiotics as needed. So the final letter in the latte method is an E for education. What are we going to teach our patients and their families? Now there is a lot, and I mean a lot, of potential teaching surrounding the topic of graft versus host disease. Some things you want to ensure your patient or their family understand are numerous and include, for starters, that graft versus host disease can be acute or chronic. Acute graft versus host disease usually occurs within three months of the transplant, three months or 100-ish days, and is more likely to affect individuals receiving stem cells from an unrelated donor. Individuals with acute GVHD have a 50% chance of developing the chronic form. Chronic GVHD usually develops three to 18 months after transplant and affects about 30% of individuals with an HLA-matched sibling donor. Also teach that if GVHD occurs in recipients who received HLA-matched cells from a sibling donor, the disease is usually less severe and responds more readily to treatment. You also want to teach that the signs and symptoms of GVHD can be varied and can include a skin rash, diarrhea, nausea and vomiting, abdominal cramps, and jaundice. They should seek medical care if they notice any of these signs and symptoms. Also teach that GVHD can affect many organs throughout the body, including the lungs, liver, and kidneys. It's also important they monitor the volume or occurrences of diarrhea as excessive losses may require additional treatment, including fluids, electrolyte replacement, or even parenteral nutrition. They should drink at least 8 to 10 8-ounce glasses of water each day to avoid dehydration, especially if they have diarrhea. They should avoid beverages and foods that promote diarrhea, such as caffeine, chocolate, greasy foods, and high sugar foods, as well as vegetables that promote gas, like cauliflower, beans, and onions. It's also important to teach about toothpaste because the mint in toothpaste, which is super, super common, can cause pain in a sensitive mouth. Two brands that offer Toothpaste flavors that don't contain any mint or menthol are Kingfisher Natural Toothpaste and Tom's of Maine. They should choose an alcohol-free mouthwash because that would be very, very irritating to a mouth with mucositis or mouth sores. And they can even make their own with one teaspoon salt and one teaspoon baking soda with four cups of water. And then rinsing the mouth with the solution can help soothe the pain associated with mucositis and may even help relieve those feelings of dry mouth. They should avoid foods and beverages that can irritate the mouth. This includes hot items, spicy foods, acidic foods and beverages, carbonated beverages, and very dry or rough textures. If they have dry mouth, teach them that sucking on sugarless candies or chewing sugar-free gum can be really helpful. And if loss of taste is a factor, 
enhanced nutritional intake by choosing foods that are most appealing. Basically, we want these individuals to eat. So go ahead and eat your favorite foods if that's what's going to help you keep your nutritional intake up. Additionally, adding non-irritating seasonings to foods can help boost their flavor. Some individuals are sensitive to the odors of foods, and when they smell food, maybe while it's cooking, they feel nauseous. So if this is the case, they should avoid foods that have strong odors, such as fish, and maybe open the windows while cooking. Other options include eating foods that are served cold or at room temperature because they tend to have less odor. To combat unintentional weight loss, they should eat small meals frequently, drink beverages that are high in calories, and add more calories and protein to the diet. They should also be advised to eat the foods they enjoy the most and add good-smelling foods to meals such as fresh baked bread. I don't know about you, but if you give me fresh baked bread, I'm eating it. They should also be taught to use lukewarm or cool water for bathing and showering because that's less irritating to the skin and use gentle moisturizing soaps that are free of fragrances. They should apply moisturizer immediately after showering or bathing while the skin is still damp as this can help lock in moisture and relieve dry skin. Speaking of skin, they should protect their skin from UV light exposure by wearing sunscreen with a UPF of 30 or greater and protective clothing. And then lastly, physical activity can help preserve joint mobility and improve symptoms of fatigue. A combination of aerobic exercise, strength training, and stretching are advised. Now, I know that was a lot, but there's actually, that was just a tiny fragment of the vast amount of teaching that would be optimal for a patient with graft versus host disease. I will put a link in the episode notes to an amazing resource provided by the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. So I really hope this episode has helped you understand graft versus host disease so that you can be prepared to encounter these patients in the clinical setting or if you're a student, encounter them on exams. If you want to get a little bit more about this topic, that episode where I talk about bone marrow transplant was episode 279. Before I close out, a little personal note. I got the nicest email today from someone named Rosie. I think it was Rosie. And basically, they were saying they they love the podcast. They love hearing about updates about my cat, Oliver. So I thought I'd give you a quick Oliver update. So if you follow me on Instagram, you know that he was sick a while back. We actually almost lost Oliver. He had to go to the ER. He had respiratory uh, failure. Basically, he was in acute respiratory distress. Good thing I noticed it, you know, my keen observation skills. I'm not a cat nurse. I'm a people nurse, but I can recognize when a cat is not doing well. I took him to the emergency vet and basically he was diagnosed with heart failure. Very, very sad. So he's now on a diuretic. He's on a antiplatelet agent and he's doing much better. I I laugh and I think he's probably cranky because he's kind of getting older. So he's cranky about his darn water pills that make him go pee all the time. But we are we're getting we're getting more accustomed to that. So Oliver's doing pretty good. And he sends all his love. He's not in here purring in the microphone right now. But um, he does always, of course, send his love because he's just the sweetest boy in the world. So that's my quick little update um, for those of you who who enjoy hearing about Oliver. So I hope to see you back here next week. And as long as you're subscribed to the show or following the show on your favorite podcast player, then you will never miss an episode. So take a quick minute to do that now, and I will see you back here next week. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing. Have you ever wondered what the science says about certain foods, products, or treatments? Does chiropractic actually work? Should I only buy organic foods? Are GMOs actually harmful? Is adrenal fatigue real? We've got you covered. The goal of the Unbiased Science Podcast is to dispel misinformation and misconceptions across an array of science and public health topics. We love to debunk myths and help arm our listeners with information so they can make evidence-based decisions. Make sure to tune in to the Unbiased Science Podcast to get all of your questions answered.